And the floor is yours for the chairman, Mr. Sean Catchmore, for our Capital Improvement Committee meeting. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the July 22nd, 2020 uh, online Capital Improvements Committee meeting of the Savannah Chatham County Board of Education. Uh, first item on our agenda is um, approval of our November 19 and September 17, 2019 minutes. Can I get a motion to that effect? Ms. So Hines moved. moves. Uh, Dr. Bringman seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next item on agenda is approval of um, today's agenda. Can I get a motion? So Ms. Moved. Hines so moves. Dr. Bringman seconds. All in favor? Say aye. 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 And so passes. And with that, um, I'm going to move on to East Boss Revenues and Budget and turn it over to Mr. Jackson. But before we do that, uh, just a reminder, because of our online format, uh, we have various presentations today, starting with Mr. Jackson. I'm going to ask that we allow each presenter to finish their presentation uh, before we start addressing questions. And if anyone has questions, uh, please raise your hand. I'm watching uh, the video and we'll call you in turn. And with that, uh, good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning. What you have before you now on slide 14 are the pretty much year-to-date tax revenues. We're showing you revenues for East Plus 1, East Plus 2, and East Plus 3. As you can see in East Plus 3, uh, for the month of May, we collected $6.5 million, which is a little more than the, the average budget amount of $6.3 million. Um, and that truly gives us a year-to-date collections. I know on the slide it says 266,000. It's actually 269,000, that was a typo. We're gonna get a revised copy out um, to you all and place on the website. So the year-to-date is actually 269,406,659 dollars for 41 out of the 60 months. So as we get into Slide 15, um, it's just a, a bar graph or line graph for the East Plus 2 revenues by year, just to give you an indication of the trends. Go to the next slide. As we get into East Plus 3, um, again, you can see the for the first three years, the counter lines are all over the place. The green is FY20. Um, we're pretty much on at the budget amount, you know, for each plus, I mean, for the first year, 2017, we averaged about $6,054,000 a month on average. Each, for the second year, 2018, we averaged about $6.3 million. Last year was a very good year. We averaged about $6.9 million in 2019. Um, but because of the economy and what's going on for 2020, we're right at the budget amount. We're averaging $6.3 million uh, through the month of May. Hopefully we will get some good months during the summer, but again, it just depends on how the economy goes. But so far, year to date, we're right at the uh, budget average of $6.3 million. Next slide. Slides 17, 18, and 19 for slides I added in because um, we always talk about spots revenue, but you really don't get a picture of the different types of revenues that are in each each East Plus. So slide 17 just gives you a picture of what happened in East Plus 1. Slide 18 gives you a picture of what happens, happened in East Plus 2. We still have some, some collections for East Plus 2 coming in for capital outlay. And in East Plus 3 on the next slide, Pretty much the same thing a year to date. Just gives you a picture of all of the revenue sources and where we are year to date. And again, they're just added for information. Now, the next few slides are basically expenditure slides that the design and capital projects teams would talk about. There was not a lot, a lot of activity in East Plus One during the month of June. Just a little activity in East Plus Two. Um, then most of the activity was in East Boss Street, but I will leave that to the 
project coordinators and design team to talk about their individual projects and what they have, have going on. Slide 37, 38 are just summaries and slide 40 for the next five slides are just summary of each box one by project. You would get the same type of report in each box two. Again, just a comprehensive summary of the projects and activities in each box three and each box two, I'm sorry. Then the same thing for each box three. We're almost to the point where we can actually close out each box one. There's a little, we have some funds left and the design team is working on closing out, closing that phase out. Hopefully we can do that within the next month or so. Then we can start removing that, those projects off of, of this report and save about probably about 20 pages, I'm sure. Um, so at this time, are there any questions? <laughs> Questions on revenue and budget? So I have, I didn't see any. I have one question um, and maybe um, Ms. Miller Kegler and her team will address this later, but we've also got cash flow projections um, and projections about um, entitlement funds. Will you be addressing those issues later in your presentation, Ms. Miller Kegler? Good morning, sir. Yes, absolutely. Well, okay. With the cash flow with you, we'll give you an update for the hour of capital outlay as well. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Howard Hall? Yes, we're, we're about to close out on East Lodge 2, right? You said within a month. So what, what, what is the typical time span to close out project? I'm sorry. That's East Lodge 1. I know. That's what I was saying. What's the typical time frame to, to close them out because that's one, you know, we hadn't gotten through two and now we're on three. So it, it, how long does it basically take to close out splash funding? It really depends on the projects. It could be, as you can see, we're going into uh, the fourth year of each splash three. So we're talking about, we collected revenues for five years. Um, you could have project, as you can see right now, that could go on another nine years at least. So it could be, you know, it just depends on the projects and, and, and what's out there. Uh, for each plus one, we just actually, we received some additional revenue um, that we need to assign to some projects somewhere and close out, but it could be, you know, it could be additional 10 to 15 years, just depending upon the projects that are out there. Thank you. All right, any other questions for uh, revenues and budget for Mr. Jackson? All right, thank you, sir. We're moving on to operations, uh, Ms. miller Kegler. Good morning, all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And um, Dr. Howard Hall, Mr. Jackson was correct. Not only are uh, the expenses and the revenue related to the actual projects, some of it is tied to capital outlay and how those applications are filed and when those funds are received from the state. So project remains open on that particular East Flash um, project or uh, the whole session remains open until all of those dollars are received and then they are expended and the reporting is completed. So that's why you continue to see us talk about East Watch 1, 2, and now that we're in 3. It's just based on the availability of those funds and then when we receive them from the state as it relates to capital outlay and policy. So um, my point this morning where I will get started, naturally we'll start talking about our calendar um, and our schedule where we are with our projects. Um, I think but what's been a burning question for a lot of us, not only from board members, but staff and from the community at whole. We're continuing to work our projects. We continue to have our projects ongoing. They're very active projects. Some projects have actually been completed, um, i.e. the stadium at Islands. Um, White Bluff has been turned over to us. We'll be working to have staff um, in, those, in that school to start unpacking and, and setting up classrooms in there. Work is continuing on our Woodville Tompkins edition. We're working with our contractor as it relates to the demolition of the of the growth site for the multi-campus and Jenkins is progressing well. So then the question becomes, you know, are we gonna have ground breakings? Are we gonna have ribbon cutting? What we're trying to do based on our current COVID-19 environment is to avoid any large gathering. 
And for those of you who had an opportunity, the exciting times we have when we're having groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings, they're well attended. So we don't want to violate any of those ordinances with um, scheduling any large gathering. Very difficult for us to schedule a groundbreaking or a ribbon cutting for 25 or 50 if the number continues to change. Um, and now you see us with more and a larger number and percentage of cases in Savannah. So just know that we recognize that this out there is an exciting time because we've been able to continue with our construction projects. But we're going to do what the science tells us to do and we're going to do with some of the investments in everybody's safe. It will be difficult for us to not have all of the folks who would want to be on the Woodville Conference Thompson's campus for the groundbreak. It would be very difficult to keep folks to 50 to be able to see the first stadium in Savannah, Chatham County. So we're going to continue to work. We'll continue to follow what the science has us to do as it relates to how we schedule. Is it possible for us to do something virtual? We're looking at that as an option, too, but there's nothing like being on those campuses on those grounds for those particular projects. So know that we have um, spent time researching, trying to determine what's going to be in the best interest. So we can have some discussion once we get to questions relative to those areas. Our project schedules are in front of you. We keep those in front of you. We update those as necessary. We can go over some of those in detail. But what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn it over to the Capital Projects team and we'll start talking about the E2 unallocated budget, the status where we are with those dollars, um, any potential changes. If you remember, when we first were confronted with um, COVID, we went in and made some adjustments to the budget, doing some forecasting. We had no idea what the revenue would be, but Mr. Jackson just shared with you where we are. Unfortunately, we're still in a good position. Our estimate was about $6.3 million, and May we came in at $6.5 million. So we're hoping that that will continue, so we're not going to have to have any um, negative impacts on our projects. We'll talk a little bit about our capital outlay projections. Um, as you recall, we changed that structure and how we were applying for capital outlay, not only just for our new schools for renovations and replacement projects, but modernization and going and looking at where we can apply for capital outlay dollars, and that would work to our advantage. So we'll be having a conversation relative to our upcoming application. We'll be bringing that before you at the August board meeting for approval as well. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Bozeman, and we'll have project updates, and then I'll come back to the board. All right. Good Mr. Bozeman, I think you need to unmute. Can you hear him? No. Mr. Bozeman, I think you need to unmute. Okay. Sure. All right. I think we no. Now we can hear you. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So uh, on the cap outlay funds pending, we have about 1.1 million dollars for Savannah Harsh re-roof, uh, Garden City, almost 600 thousand dollars, and we just got uh, update from the Georgia DOE uh, saying no. Mm -mm. Mr. Bozeman, we just lost you again. And Ms. Miller Kegler, you're muted too. Yeah, no, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay, good deal. All right. All right. So, potential budget changes that we talked about. Uh, we have approximately over $12 million in budget changes. Uh, and that includes changes uh, from savings that we will get from White Bluff. But as we go back on any project, we go back and take a look at what are the potential changes that we may see in the future. And we make adjustments to our budgets to include those. Some of the significant changes that we're seeing is on the multi-campus, uh, and that is in terms of the FF&E, the athletics, 
and the campus police in the CTAE building. And so we're seeing an increase of $9 million. Keep in mind that when we originally- Mr. Bozeman, your, your audio is fading in and out. Okay. Can you, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yep. Okay. All right. So I was discussing about the potential budget changes. And those potential budget changes, the main changes is on the multi-campus school. When we originally budget for this uh, particular building, uh, athletics and CTA and campus police was not part of that. When we went back and took a look at that, we're going to add $9 million to that particular budget, uh, as well as a new uh, K-8 uh, FTE and permitting. It's going to cost us about $800,000. And then Jenkins is going to cost us about $1.3 million uh, for a total budget of about $12 million in changes. As a result of that, we go back and take a look at our cash flow and make sure that we have a positive cash flow. In the salmon area, those projects that you see in the salmon area, we are not starting those projects. Those projects would have gotten started in our fifth year. And as a result of what we don't know from the COVID impact, we're not gonna start those. The main two that I wanna talk about is the gym to auditorium uh, conversion that is going to, should happen on Wilson Forest High School and also the Largo to Bet uh, addition. Those two projects, we're, we're not gonna start until we ensure that our revenues and our collections are coming in where we think they should be. When we made the adjustment for those projects, we're now showing a positive cash flow of $24 million. That's not that we have that in the bank, but it just shows that uh, taking those projects out, that we can do, we will have a cash flow of 24 million. On the next slide, we'll talk about our capital outlay application, which will be coming for you to you for approval. These are some of the projects that we are looking at in terms of capital outlay. Uh, these, as we take a look at our facility condition index, these are some of the projects that uh, that needs a lot of renovation and modifications in those. And so we'll be putting together an application that will be coming before you for next board meeting. Here's some of the description of what needs to happen in some of these schools, uh, mostly uh, painting, ceiling replacements, roofs, HVAC. And these are a list of the schools that we're taking a look at in ensuring that uh, we have a good comprehensive program for our capital outlay. On the next slide, E4 is among us. So we have put together a schedule. Currently, we in data collection. We're taking a look at our FCI facility condition index and our facility condition assessment. And we're putting together a list of projects that uh, we believe that uh, should be supported in the East Bloss referendum. Uh, once we get that, we will develop a detailed plan and then we will bring it to the board for review and approval. But laid out in front of you is a schedule that we have to adhere to in order to ensure that we uh, are prepared to publish for a call for election. I'll go over some of the project updates. Uh, as discussed earlier, we are completed with uh, White Bluff Elementary School. Uh, that school is being turned over to us and we're preparing for the teachers to move in and turn that over to operation and maintenance. Jenkins High School is going very well. Uh, we don't see any uh, issues in finishing that on time. Uh, same way with New Hampstead, we have experienced some uh, soil conditions uh, however, uh, we are uh, no issues in, in completing that school. Uh, the multi-campus will start demolition uh, mid-August, and uh, we're in design development on that and should be publishing uh, our construction documents and have that on the street uh, no later than November. Islands High School Athletic Complex is completed. 
uh, and that is being turned over to operation and maintenance uh, as well. Beach High School Auditorium is going very well. Uh, we see no issues. Uh, that got extended out, uh, and so we are expected to complete that around January timeframe. With Bill Tompkins, we finally got out of the uh, uh, issue with the soils, and uh, that particular project is progressing as well. Uh, and so uh, we should continue to see a lot of uh, uh, vertical and horizontal going on that particular project. Savannah Arts Academy is still under design. We're taking a look at uh, everything in, in terms of uh, that particular school. That's $19.5 million. And so it's, it's still in design development. Uh, and we're getting uh, feedback from uh, the different entities that have to go into that particular school. Site improvements is, is a big one on that particular school uh, to include parking, utilities, and stormwater management and landscaping. And so that one still is under design. Savannah High School Stadium is still under design as well. Uh, we're taking a lesson learned that we had at Islands and incorporating into that one. And that project is uh, looking pretty good. Our security vegetables, uh, again, uh, we, are, we have completed about seven of those. Uh, we are now uh, taking a look at all of the security vegetables that we have to do in coordination with uh, Chief Enoch. Uh, we are still uh, needing additional funding, about $3.8 million. And so we're taking a look at our renovation budgets and seeing if we can incorporate those into the renovation budgets. And I don't believe that's going to be an issue or problem. But we're going ahead and designing all of them. And here's some pictures of what they look after, after the completion of those particular projects. Some of the renovation projects that we're doing, J.G. Smith uh, got budgeted by $2.7 million, interior renovations and designs. Uh, Henderson for me, uh, we're putting the HBAC in there. Uh, Georgetown, we're finishing up on the HBAC in our alarm, uh, fire alarm, and we're repaving uh, Interchange Court and Gamble Road. Uh, sports lighting, uh, we have Beach, New Hampshire, and Nines High School, all of those projects. Uh, uh, going in, New Hampshire lights went in first, uh, be followed by Beach and then Islands. Going green. Uh, so we've made the commitment to go ahead and change out all our fluorescent lights. Uh, it's hard to kind of get those bubs. And so these are some of the schools that we have uh, gone to 100% LED light installation. And our goal is to get all our schools LED, which saves on our operation and maintenance, maintenance costs in the long run. And so here's the schedule where we at, and our next phase will be a next set of five or six schools until we get them all completed. And just some project photos of some of the projects that we have uh, ongoing. And just some updates on the some of our maintenance and operation projects. ADA ramp uh, is being completed. The Rand Middle School fire alarm replacement are ongoing. Savannah High School chiller is ongoing as well. Myers uh, uh, School boilers and pump replacement. West Chatham gym rooftop units replacement. And at this time, I'll open it up for any questions that you may have for capital projects. Uh, before I call on people, um, I'm sure we all have questions about COVID-related um, adjustments and modifications to capital projects. So I'll ask Ms. Miller-Kegler or Mr. Bozeman to address those after I ask if there are any questions about any of the specific projects that we've mentioned. Ms. Hall, then Ms. Wade. Um, Mr. Bozeman, good morning. I want to ask about Jacob G. Smith. If okay. we're spending $2.7 million on renovations, modernization, how long is that going to extend the life of that school before we'll actually have to do a replacement on the tubes? 
Okay, so in our total assessment of that particular school, it is around $10 million of modernization that has to be done. This is just the first phase of that particular school. Uh, during this COVID-19, we saw an interest in having uh, community schools nestled in the community. And so we're targeting uh, J.G. Smith uh, in E4 as a modernization. Uh, again, that is about $8 million. This 2.4 is just a down payment on it. And basically, it's going to go in there and do life safety type uh, things in the particular school. Uh, if you look at that school, if you if you look at the egress and egress of that particular school, that school was built uh, in the, I believe, 1950s. And so uh, some of the egress is not what it needs to be for in today's environment to get the kids out of there. So we're going in and putting in more uh, doors so uh, the kids can have a, a, a way to get out of there. Uh, we're also going in and looking and doing the uh, windows, making sure that it is energy efficient. But the answer to your question is that uh, the investment that we put into that particular school is well worth it. And we had to replace it. We could not replace it there on site because it does not meet the minimum acreage for that particular school. And so from a modernization standpoint, yes, it makes sense to do that. And how long, I'm asking, how long will this modernization last? I mean, a new school lasts 40, 50 years. We're spending $10 million. How long can we expect that to maintain that environment? I understand the, the joy of staying as a little community school, but I'm just wondering how long, in terms of our money, this modernization is going to last before something else will have to be done. Yeah, once we go in there and change all the life safety items out of it, uh, we would go back, I say, for a roof is 20 years, for HVAC, 20 years. So it will it will restore its life expectancy back to it. Uh, those schools built in the 1950s are very sound in terms of construction. And so going in and uh, replacing HVAC, windows, doors, and things of that nature uh, makes sense, and it will give it the life expectancy that it, you would normally have to replace these things out, even with a brand new school, but it will, it will restore those life expectancy back to the normal process. Okay, thank you. Ms. Wade? Thank you. Actually, Ms. Hall, I had a question about Jacob D. Smith, too. I wanted to confirm, E3, Jacob D. Smith was slated to get a new addition. Is that still on the books? Uh, for a new addition, uh, I don't... I don't believe that was part of E3 was there was going to be a 10 classroom or 12 classroom wing added. What is the status of that project? All right. So when we took a look at the adding the classroom wing, the space is just not there. Uh, from a from a design perspective, uh, we don't have we can't put a, a a detention pond on that particular site. And so when we did the analysis, if we put a wing, we can't even get permitted for a wing. Uh, so what we went back and took a look at is what we can do. And so what we want to do is total modernization of the school. Uh, yeah, it would be great to put another wing on there. But in order to do that, then you have to make sure that you can manage the water on the site itself. And because uh, you're landlocked by the houses that are around that, we, we just don't have a the area to put a uh, detention pond. Okay. And so the $2.7 million that we saw in your presentation, is that part of E3 or is that being proposed for E4? No, that is that is actually E3. Okay. So that's just what's being done instead of the addition. That, that's correct. If you look at the total, it's about 8 to $10 million to get that school up to where it really needs to be in the 21st century. And so that's what we're proposing uh, because it, if you go in and ask Georgia DOE, can we replace it? It doesn't meet the minimum criteria of acreage. And so they're not going to let us replace it. So therefore, then the next best thing is, okay, what can we do? We can go in there and totally modernize it, bring it up to speed uh, for the 21st century and get it permitted. Uh, but when we looked at trying to add a wing to it, uh, the city would not permit it because we can't, it's nowhere to keep the water on the site. And right now we're having just issues with the driveway 
uh, uh, you know, and coaching on the driveway in the back. And so we got to go in there and do some things in there. One of, one of the things we, we take a look right away is uh, making sure that all the driveways are asphalted. Uh, but when you start putting asphalt onto an area like that, uh, you got to control the water. Uh, the neighbors around that is not going to let you put water on their sites. And so that's, that's the issue that we're dealing with. So we're going to go in there and totally modernize it, uh, make sure that we are, uh, it will pass a permit and code, uh, and then we think it will last another 20, 25 years. And just to remind the board or for new board members, about three or four years ago, Ms. Miller Kegler and I and other members of her team met with parents of Jacob D. Smith. And at that time, they did not want a new building. They wanted to keep the building. Um, so that was right, just a general yeah. consensus of both families and staff at that time for that facility. So I'm glad to see where. Ms. Wade, any other questions? No. Ms. That's it, Ms. Wade? That's it. Okay, Ms. Hines, and then Dr. Howard Hall, and then Ms. Hall. Thank you very much uh, for your report, uh, Mr. Bozeman. I have a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask uh, each one that you respond to it, because the second was a little different than the first one. Now, I noticed that we are going to do some pavement uh, um, for the uh, around the, the maintenance buildings. But um, is that all we're going to do? Because, you know, we took a tour uh, to that area and there were many, many things we said we saw that were lacking and hoping that something would be done. So are we going to do anything besides uh, paving the, uh, the lots? Yeah, uh, good morning, Ms. Hines. Absolutely good correct. Um, we had an opportunity to transfer some of the dollars close to the end of the fiscal year from the transportation budget to allow us to move forward with, with at least working on the pavement and on the parking lot because that has not only a negative impact on our asset on our buses, our bus drivers' vehicles, and their condition walking through potholes early in the morning or when it's coming back in the afternoon. We've actually proceeded with having some work um, completed on the, the, the restrooms on the interior of the building. That was a major concern. So most of that work is ongoing and we're probably about 80% complete. And Mr. Bartra, um, correct me as it relates to the status of that project. That was actually the first project and we'll make sure moving forward that we include that work because it is important. Um, our employees are essential. So the bathroom work at um, Interchange Court, the main facility, that is underway as well as the two parking lots. So we'll start putting together um, the a comprehensive project, tell you where we are in the phases um, with that. But we wanted to take advantage and not have to come to the general fund because there were dollars in the transportation budget. So we transferred those funds that you remember over to the 308 account to allow us to go ahead and get started on that work. Yeah. So thanks for reminding us of that and we'll make sure we include that moving forward in the presentation. Thank you. And my second question um, is concerning, it's, it has to do with COVID-19. Uh, schools that have windows that that they can open, are they going to be allowed to open those windows to allow uh, more circulation? Or is, this, or is this a safety hazard or whatever? And we're, we're looking at um, the, the filters that we're currently using. Uh, we've recommended replacing um, those. We are modifying how our system runs traditionally after school hours. We traditionally had a set point that automatically would turn the system down. Now we're running the ventilation around the clock. The system doesn't come down. Because you know, if we went to a meeting, we had to make sure it stayed on. So the building wasn't warm. So we're doing everything that's based on our reading and our research that we can increase the ventilation in all of those buildings. So you also want to see on school buses, when we start delivering meals, where we can keep the windows down, we'll have those windows down um, while we're out in the public. So Mr. Barcher, if you want to add anything, please feel free to. But based on the research and information that's coming before us, certainly that's something that we're going to be considering. Thank you. Ms. Hines, are those your questions for now? I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Howard Hall? Yes, I have three questions from Mr. Bozeman. I asked them all at once, and, and if I have to repeat, I will. The first question, there's a $9 million additional need for our multi-school um, campus for um, K-12 
campus police, athletics, and CTAE. Could you give us some details on exactly what that's needed for? Second question is, that, is um, what impact did the issue with the soil at Woodville Tompkins have on the, the completion date? And if, you, and if you have a date in sight, please share the information with us. And then finally, could you expound a little on the FTE permitting that's needed for the K-8 part of the um, multi-school multi multi school campus, <laughs> multi-complex? Okay, can you clarify on the FTE for me? Yeah, there's that's part of the um, the nine million. I want to think when you said the, there's the new FTE permitting. So I just want you could you expound on that? Is there an increase in in attendance? Um, do we have to read what was that about? You mentioned something about new FTE permitting. FTE permitting. Okay. Are you saying permitting? Yeah, the, the, the permits, the FTE permit to permit it. I don't think that was FTE, but let me let me get to your first question first. Uh, so I, I'll take them in order. Uh, the nine million dollars that uh, we're looking at for uh, the K twelve. When this school was originally, uh, when we originally put together the budgets. Uh, and I will remind the board that this was three different schools. Uh, you got you had Gould, Mercer, uh, as well as uh, the high school itself. We were able to save about fourteen million dollars uh, because we had money in there for uh, to acquire properties uh, for a new Gould because we couldn't build Gould where it was. And so as a result of that, we took that $14 million out of the total budget of this particular school. But as the school scoped out and we saw that, okay, we wanted to have a 3,000-seat stadium, uh, we also wanted to ensure that campus police still maintain a presence uh, at that particular school. None of this was included in the original scope because at that point in time, uh, the uh, capital projects did not put together a scope for a K-12. Those was going to be individual projects. So once we put that together and we removed the $14 million and we went through our scope development, we saw that we were going to take a need for about $9 million. Also, taking take in consideration, these budgets are put together five years ahead of time. And so... From that standpoint, if you just use 3%, you're talking about 15%. 15% of about $100 million is $15 million. So $9 million, where it, where it may seem to be a lot, really, it's, it's really not a lot of money over a five, six, five, six million uh, period of time. And at that point in time, we were not putting in contingencies uh, in, as part of our budgets. We're now doing that. And so at that point in time, this budget did not include it because it was not included as a K-12. Did that answer the question on the $9 million? So is that for, does you have to design it or are you adding on to what you previously had? Well, the scope, the scope increased from what we previously had. We previously had three schools, an elementary school. We had a, we had a, pro, we had a project for Mercer. We had a project for Gould, And then we had the high school. Mm -hmm. As a result of those schools combining all those, we took $14 million out of that particular budget. So that was cost savings to us. If you combine them, we took $14 million out of it. What we're now saying is that now that we have scoped this school out and develop it, we need nine more million dollars of that $14 million we took out of it. And I don't, I don't, I think it was F T E. I think it was F F and E. F and E. And then there were also. I misunderstood. That's why it threw me off. I thought I heard F T E. Right. But the way listed on the sheet, and that's why I pulled it and passed it over. F F and E, and the permitting process and the cost associated with it. Yes. So F F and E. What we're seeing now. You don't have to worry about that. But I just thought F T E. That's why I. No. It's F F and E. F and E. Right. Okay. Yeah, the second question was Woodville soil. Right. 
Okay. Yes, that's going to have an impact. We're still evaluating that uh, because we had not gone uh, completely through that project. But right now, we're, we're saying that, hey, we're going to be delayed at least 30 days as a result of the SAW issues. So is there a timeline date in mind with that 30 days? Do you have any? Because I was over there um, Monday morning. I was at Lower Woodville and took the opportunity to ride down the back end. If you've not gone over and you can see the standing water in the back of the building. So all of that needs to be tested. And once we get those results back, I think then the team will probably be in a better condition to, to give you a timeline. Because we want to make sure that we are being very comprehensive in all of our studies before we actually start building. But we'll, we'll certainly keep your breath. Um, this is just... Brown, Ms. Mary said that um, we prepare the reports every month, so if there's something that's critical, we'll make sure that we get it you're out to the team to give you an update if necessary. But all of the projects are still going on. Okay. So, and we're still in good state. Okay. With the, the demolition at, at Groves, the demolition that's scheduled for mid-August, I think we said, mid-August. August. Yes, that's yeah, that's still on schedule for mid August. And so so yeah, no issues there. Okay, and I and I wait for other questions once we, everybody can discuss the COVID part because I don't want to get into that right now. Okay. Okay, I think uh Ms. Hall was next. You muted. I knew. I wanted to ask a final question about Jacob G. Smith, what the student count is there. Uh, I can tell you what the capacity of J.G. Smith is. If you have another question, I need to find my glasses, so. Oh, that was just it. And I, I mean, I can certainly wait on that. I can wait on that, Mr. Cashman. Um, in that building, their, their 10th day enrollment was at about 481. And you know, we have one modular over there, and we cannot place another modular on that, that property just because of the size of it. And I want to thank, it may have been previous school year, we went over and worked with them as related to how we can convert some of their space in the classroom, but they're only at about, um, their, their enrollment was about 481. Thank you. Uh -huh. And that put them actually over capacity with that number. Ms. Hall, any other questions? No, no, thanks very much. Sure, Dr. Bringman. Um, for Mr. Bozeman and Ms. Uh, Miller-Kegler, um, on the East Floss 3, um, almost $8 million for the Windsor Forest High School auditorium construction. If our revenue were to stay flat or if we needed to uh, not spend that money by the end of East Floss 3, um, is it allowable to roll projects over into East Floss 4 or to bring that project even maybe as a cost savings out of East Floss 3 into a proposed larger project in East Floss 4 um, that would um, benefit all of Windsor Forest High School and Windsor Forest Elementary. If you uh, go back and look through East Floss 1 and 2, we have kind of nickeled and dimed both of those schools with little repairs here and there. Um, and it seems like we've got another $8 million sitting out there for a another, not duct tape repair, but a good upgrade that could maybe be rolled into a, pro a larger project that would uh, save funding um, for the long haul. That's something, that, and I'll turn over to Mr. Bozeman as well. That's something that we've done in the past. And, um, White Bluff is a prime example. White Bluff crossed over E2 and into E3. We made the decision instead of going in and renovating and continuing to add on to the school, is to take those funds at the end of E2 and made um, White Bluff a priority in E3. So that's why you see that as the first school um, that is being completed. It was the very same thing with May Howard. Um, that was the originally slated for renovations and additions. And when we were confirmed with the state, it was the decision was made to let's build a new school because it was in our best interest and it was most cost efficient. So we'll be looking at that as we're doing our data gathering as a part of our planning for, for E4. Where can we be most efficient? How can we make sure we're meeting the needs of the schools and students in the community 
as well. So those are the kinds of things that you'll see us evaluating and bringing forward as a recommendation to you all. Okay, so the, the answer to your question, this school was built in 1967. Uh, when we did a remaining service life index, which tells us what is the uh, life expectancy of this school out of 100 points, which is what you want to get, it has 28, 28 uh, points. So what that tells us is that if we don't go and start replacing this school in the future, we're going to have some catastrophic failures in terms of HVAC and some of the other components to this particular school. So this school here is being targeted uh, for replacement in E4. So the answer to your question is, should we spend $8 million converting the gym? Uh, the data shows that the school needs to be replaced. Uh, we'll be bringing a recommendation to the uh, superintendent, but Based upon these numbers, uh, we believe that school needs to be replaced. Thank you. Do you by hand uh, have what the elementary school's rating is currently? I did not pull that, but we can get that to you. Yeah, I know it's, I, I can pull it too from an older uh, document that you've given us. Thank you. It's higher than the high school, but you know, not where we want it. Yeah, it's not much higher. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. All right, any other questions on existing projects from board members? Um, Dr. Howard Hall? Yes, as, as part of the athletics portion of the, the, the multi-school campus, does that include um, putting a sound wall up behind the next, alongside of the stadium? Or does that include cost for a sound wall or has all of that been um, included previously? Yes, that includes the sound wall and also the landscape that goes with that. All right, um, I'm going to now ask um, Ms. Miller-Kagler, Mr. Bozeman, um, Mr. Batra, or whoever, are there any COVID-specific capital project issues um, that we need to be aware of or address? I, any, are we are we taking? I mean, where's all the money coming from for whatever we're doing for COVID? Running utilities twenty four seven, um, uh, upgrading fil air filters, okay. you know, all the PPE we're buying. Oh, you know, are we putting okay. plexiglass in and all that? Is this coming out of East Blast? Is it coming out of? general fund or a combination? Is there something we need to be thinking about as a board? We need another 20 million for plexiglass. I'm, any issues along those lines? Um, the way we're managing PPE right now, and Mr. Jackson's probably still on the line, is the amount of money that's been awarded to the district is about $9 million. Is that correct, Larry? And we as a cabinet, we have gone um, through a, a, an extensive evaluation and we still don't know what we're dealing with and how long we're going to be um, in the pandemic. But the PPEs, the plexiglass that we've talked about that we've already installed, that is coming out of that particular fund. That is not coming out of East Blush. It's not having an in impact on our East Blush budget. So what the equipment that we have purchased, the supplies, all of that is being funded from the $9 million that's been awarded to the district. From the CARES Act? From the right. CARES Act, yeah. Okay. So we all have um, things that we're working with, and I believe, I think I saw Dr. LeVette sign in, and, and Mr. Jackson, we're going to be bringing those budgets back to the board uh, for final review and approval, but the intent is for us to continue to utilize those dollars. We're looking at how we can be most efficient. We're buying in bulk whenever we get those opportunities from the state. Just as we have re received a pallet of masks, uh, we've received thermometers, and we're making sure that where we can go in and make an adjustment to what we're purchasing, we do that. Whatever, again, where we can buy in bulk, we've kind of centralized that process that it's all coming through operations. Whenever there's a specific need, we make sure that we provide it to the schools. That way we can capitalize on volume purchasing for equipment, supplies, and all other PPEs. We're going to be monitoring our utility bills closely. So we want to be able to make sure that those schools are properly ventilated, but you are correct. It's going to have an impact on that utility bill. 
But we don't want to sacrifice the safety. If the science, if the research is telling us we need to make sure that we increase the ventilation in those buildings, then that's what we're going to be recommending. All right. And I'm all about safety first. I'm just concerned about the budgets. Yeah, and we, yes, that sir. Kind of thing. And that's correct. We do have those budgets. Um, we set down again as a, a cabinet. We went over that um, dollar amount. We'll make the final recommendations as to what the needs will be um, for each of the areas to include you know, technology, school nutrition, which will come under operations. Um, all of us are looking at what, you know, safety, the well-being of our students, academics. All of us will be um, making a presentation as to what those needs are going to be as it relates to COVID. Thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. Levette to offer any closing comments, but before I do, I just want to say to the board, we're going to start E4 planning. Um, two things to think about. Number one, um, last time we did the election in the summer, um, which is when we have nonpartisan elections and there was a debate whether to do it when we have nonpartisan and primary elections or in November. Uh, not asking for opinions now, but just think about that. And then um, one thing I wanted to say about E4 planning, you know, given our abrupt need to go online, we need to think about whether our technology budget needs to be more robust to give us more flexibility with future yeah. pandemics, murder hornets, hurricanes, you know, whatever, whatever's coming. So um, board, um, I know staff has already been thinking about it, but we're going to be pulled into the planning process in the next six months or so. So give some thought uh, to what, you know, what we want to see there. Um, and with that, uh, good morning, Dr. Levette. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to say good morning. Um, thank you for being patient as I met with principals early this morning to address uh, remaining concerns that they have. Um, I agree with Mr. Kachmar that we need to be thinking um, beyond what the way we've been thinking. We certainly have been um, obsessed with um, concerns about COVID, but we also have a flu season, which will complicate the COVID picture. And we have hurricanes that we still have to um, contend with. So I appreciate thinking ahead. I do believe that we'll need to rethink um, the East Blast portion, uh, the East Blast budget, which um, to address some of the technology needs. So thank you for your uh, participation this morning. and. Um, we do look forward to receiving questions that you might have that we can respond to more fully. We're also available to talk with you individually if you have remaining concerns. Thank you for your attention. And on behalf of the board, I think I can say for all of us, um, y'all pivoted really well in the spring um, and you've maintained flexibility in light of unforeseen, unanticipated circumstances uh, so thank you for your hard work. Uh, we appreciate it. And with that, uh, any other questions or comments for the good of the order? Dr. Howard Hall. Yes, I just like, I was just thinking about White Bluff, you know, the new building. And I know amid COVID-19, we can't do what we normally do. But since the teachers are actually moving in the school, will there be anything done as far as maybe news media or something of the sort since the teachers are moving into a building that we've never had a chance to celebrate as far as a ribbon cutting or whatever ceremony. So would anything, has anything be considered since teachers are actually moving into to a new building? Um, yeah. Mr. Kachmar, if I could, um, uh, Dr. Howard Hall raises a question I would really like to speak to, um, which I think will be helpful given the correspondence that's been floating around about uh, teacher um, workspace. So I would really appreciate an opportunity to address that as well as um, Dr. Howard Hall's specific question regarding white bluff, if, if I may. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to um, clarify perhaps some misunderstanding. We did survey all of our school-based staff because teachers are not the only persons who work in buildings. So if we're going to extend an opportunity for them um, under pandemic conditions, we have to think about all of the employees. So we did a survey to determine 
um, people's work preferences. Of course, our White Bluff staff has indicated that they would like to, most of them would like to work in their building. Um, I think we indicated earlier, if we didn't, I just want to make a point of saying that I did ask Mr. Uh, Bozeman to um, have a virtual tour done of not only it, but also any other completed projects I believe I pointed out during the board meeting that we would be doing something around the stadium as well as White Bluff Elementary. We'll try to get those um, plans along with all the other tasks done in the next um, few days so that we can um, make sure that you have an opportunity to see those buildings and spaces. We'll um, invite you to come out and to tour them, but we will not be able to have the public gatherings that we've typically had whenever we have been able to open a building. Um, that is just not going to be possible unless you're willing to um, uh, limit um, or give us some criteria for limiting um, who is present. So we can talk about that offline, but certainly I think many of the White Bluff teachers have, many of the White Bluff staff teachers and others who work in that building have indicated a, a desire to work in that building. We'll try to work through that as we try to work through um, all of the other concerns. I do also want to make sure that you know, not everyone wants to work in the building, White Bluff or not. <laughs> uh, some people want to work at a building that is closest to their homes. So we're trying to uh, meet those as much as we can. We're trying to reduce the stress of everyone else is creating a lot of stress for us. We're trying to uh, accommodate as much as we can. Um, so please know that that's the intention and it would help us if you would direct any questions regarding um, work locations to us so that we can work through it with any concerned individual. Thank you so much. Ms. Hall. I was wondering if this might be a good time for Ms. Tagler to go over her um, cluster statement from last week, because I know there's a lot of confusion about that. Relative to, and, and that's going to be based upon the results of the survey, um, the cluster that we um, would like to consider one where we can not only utilize the site for resources whenever there's a specific need for uh, a member of a school to have access to district resources to make it available. Is it in our best interest to open a building for five people and the school next door has 20 or 30? Will it be in our best interest to combine them in that building, in several buildings across the district? Um, as Dr. Levesque said, it's easier for them to, um, from where they reside to a school and make those resources available. As a reminder, we'll still be responsible to provide meal service to students. So just as we talked about the cost of utilities, will it be in our best interest to make specific buildings available and a cluster for resources and for the purpose of preparing meals. We'll still have to prepare, pack, and transport meals to students. So what our plan is, and we'll continue to do our research before we make any recommendation back, is will this work based on the data, based on the number of teachers and staff who has an interest of utilizing a building for resources and to be able to prepare meals and distribute those meals across the district. Remember, we serve students from the Bloomingdale line all the way to time. We'll have to continue to provide meals to those students, so we want to be able to minimize the number of buildings that we use and possibly recommend a cluster format. Okay, I'm going to act like a kindergartner so that I'm sure I'm sending out the right information to people who ask me. If I want to come into Duren School to teach, if I'm going to do all of my virtual teaching from Duren School, but I'm the only one at Duren School who wants to do that, 
you might have me go to beach or to Hodge to do my teaching rather than have a whole school open with just me and perhaps a couple of other teachers there. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I think the word resources was what I was not understanding. So I'm a teacher and I can teach from a cluster school with other teachers so that we don't have to open buildings that are three fourths empty. Exactly. We want to be able to have as many. And remember, we're still under the requirements to limit the number of individuals that we can have in a building. So we're going to have to take all of those factors in consideration as we're doing our work. Thank you. So I understand if, it now. If, I, if you are a, a, a Durant Middle School teacher and Beach um, is that cluster site, then certainly you have the opportunity to go into Durant, retrieve items that you need to assist you in your instructional process. We'll make access to those buildings available. But we're just talking long term if it's your desire to teach from a building. I, Thank you. I, think, I think the key here, Ms. Hall, is we have to say perhaps to all of this. I think these right. are operational issues. And, you know, I think we need to let Dr. LeVette roll this out to staff and administrators. Um, I know we're all getting questions about it. Um, but, you know, I think we can say at this point from the board, we want flexibility. We all express that or some of us express that at the board meeting but how to implement that um, operationally, let Dr. Levette roll that out um, rather than us giving, you know, mixed or confused messages. So I agree. I think, I and I think that's what Dr. Levette said she was going to do. Um, so what, the questions I keep getting, and I'm, I'm getting five to 10 calls or emails a day, what I'm saying is um, I don't think the specific plans have been rolled out yet. Stay tuned. I know you're impatient, but stay tuned. Uh, I think that's good. And I also want to say any board member who didn't see the press conference yesterday, you really need to see it because it was outstanding and it really answered a lot of questions that we still had. Um, thank you, Ms. Hall and Mr. Kachmar and Mrs. Kegler. Um, you know, the other thing that we, um, I think in, in, we give a lot of information. I think people read it or they hear it. They don't remember it. They just kind of focus in on one thing that maybe um, was not clear to them. I met, I was late to this meeting because I was meeting with principals this morning. We'll leave here later and meet with another group of principals, but everyone's just very stressed. They, and you hear from people who say, I want to work at my home. Then you hear from people who say, I have an hour and a half drive. Can I work at a building that is closer to my home so that I can access the resources? So yes, there were a few people in the building this summer, but just remember, if you open your doors and you have 50 or 60 people coming into that building that weren't coming in there before, it changes also the hygiene and the cleaning requirements. So yes, buildings were open this summer, and yes, there were just a few people in that building. But now when you say you're going to open the building and you have 50 or 60 people or maybe 40 people coming in or 20 people coming in every day, you have now increased your cleaning responsibilities and your risk. So, yes, I'm very clear on that. We are thinking of it. I know it may not appear that we're thinking of all these things, but trust us to do that. And if you have suggestions, we are certainly welcome um, welcoming them, but just know that we're thinking about all the opportunities. You may not hear um, all the requests, but we have a number of people who teach out of, who live out of county, but teach in the county and do not necessarily want an hour and a half drive in or an hour drive in. So we are trying to meet their needs as well. Um, so thank you for trusting us to try to work with our staff. The safest thing to do is direct them to us and we will talk with them and see what their individual situation is like. But we're trying to make as many, as many accommodations as possible and appreciate your patience um, and know that we are practicing compassion. Thank you. On the uh, building 
opening ribbon cutting issues discussed previously, you know, my personal opinion is if we're doing virtual school, we should not be having people gather together to do a ribbon cutting. Um, it, the, the optics are wrong. The messaging is wrong. And in addition, um, we shouldn't have, you know, we shouldn't be leading large group gatherings. Um, if we couldn't have in-person graduation, we shouldn't have in-person ribbon cuttings um, until it's safer. That's my two cents. Um, any other comments, questions for the good of the order? Seeing none, um, we will, uh, I'll get with Ms. Miller Kegler and Dr. Levette about another CIC date in the fall. And we'll circulate that, uh, that information at some point. With that, thank you everyone for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>